and I'm going to do something to start by faith here today. And I'm going to put on a robe. <laughs> and there's a couple reasons I'm going to do this today. And as I, as I put it on here, I'm going to tell you, and some of you probably have already know, we, you know, we're a pretty casual church, so we don't usually wear robes. All right, so why am I putting on a robe today? I will tell you. Isaiah 61, 10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation, and he has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. So I just want to, by faith today, put on, this is an act of faith, put on the garment of salvation and the robes of righteousness. And this is, you know, this is what we do by faith. This is a physical role, but sometimes we do it by faith. And so I don't know where you guys have been this week. I don't know what's happened. I don't know what you've done. I don't know what mistakes you've made. You know, the thing that dad has said, sometimes you feel like sin on a popsicle stick. And I was thinking, that's what Jesus became for you. Jesus became sin for you, that you might become the righteousness of God in Christ. And so whatever we're going through today, we can just receive the robe of righteousness. So I do that today. I put it on by faith. Praise the Lord. And I want to minister to you today about um, idolatry. <laughs> so it's a good thing I put this on, guys. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay. <laughs> The scripture says in Ephesians 6, We do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but with principalities, powers, rulers of darkness in the heavenly places. So guys, we don't, we're not wrestling with people. Yes. And that's a mistake that we can make, is we start to think that the per people are a problem. People are not a problem. It's, it's the things that are driving them. Yes. And um, I, I shared with you a little bit, uh, I think it was a couple weeks ago, about Father Altman. He's a, he's a firebrand in the Catholic Church right now. And he did a great message, and he said that the spiritual warfare manifests against our soul. Yes. And temptation. Yes. Things like that that come against us. And everybody has weak areas, and those things come against us. Yes. And the devil's trying to find a way into our lives. Yes. And so, but we have, to, we have to put on the garments of salvation, the robe of righteousness, receive those things, and then trust the Lord to lead us how to wrestle with the, with the powers that are in, uh, that are in the age. Yes. Amen. So let's pray before we continue. Lord, I just thank you right now that you are good. Thank you that you're merciful. Thank you that you are kind and gracious, Lord. And Lord, I just thank you that we want to be more like Jesus. So I pray for that today. Lord, I pray that any word I say, say in this pulpit today, Lord, would be used to change people's hearts, change my heart, move us forward into our destiny, Lord. I pray against anything that would try to keep us from entering our destiny, or even disqualify us from what you want to do in our lives. So we ask, Lord, that you'd help us. Give us your grace today. And I thank you for it. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know, I'm thinking about, before I get into my message, you can pull up the, the slide, the standing against the gods of the age. I preached part one last week, which I encourage you to go and watch on YouTube. It's really important. And I, I, didn't, I didn't pull any punches. <laughs> I don't, I mean, maybe there's some more I could have punched. I don't know. But there's a compromise, a spirit of compromise in the nation today, you guys, yes, that's right. in the church, that we won't call out idolatry. We won't call out what is, is happening. And another, the second reason that I'm wearing the black robe here today is that our founding fathers, the pastors, were the ones who preached about the news. They preached about what's happening in the culture. They preached about it. And today, people don't preach about it. They, talk, they give motivational talks and call it good. And you know, um, and I said last week, I think it was last week, we don't have anything against big churches here. No. Nothing. But you know, Mario Murillo said, if the mega church came to fix the problem in the nation, what problem did it fix? Because under the, under the supervision of Christian celebrity uh, and, and mega churches and mega ministries and, and Christian corporatism, yeah. capitalism, should we say, even though there's nothing wrong with free market capitalism, it's because how people are wired, right? So, so under the watch of that, our nation is falling off of a cliff morally. And so, um, 
So what, another thing I was going to say is that this is a slightly different topic, but I would just want to say, point out uh, the grace of God on our lives. Um, and th so I want to say this before I jump into the standing against the God's age. You guys see Elijah's grace, right? And that's jumping on a trampoline. I don't have a grace to do that. <laughs> I might really, really, really wish badly that I could do that, but it's not on my life. The grace is not on my life. And so what we need to do is we need to figure out what is the grace that's on your life to flow in. And God's grace is on me to preach up here, right? It's not to jump on a trampoline, <laughs> which is awesome. But we need to find out what is the grace of God in our lives, and we need to flow in that grace. And that can be difficult, but we need to do it. Okay, so let's, yes. let's, uh, let's delve into this topic. So standing against the gods of the age, part two. Um, we have to first understand the enemy. How can you fight the enemy if you don't know who the enemy is? Yes. Right. And the majority of the church today, not only they don't know who they're fighting, but some of them actually have joined the enemy. Yes, yes. that's right. Yep. right. Claiming, to be, claiming to be the body of Christ, they're actually resisting the body of Christ. Yes. And we've seen that this past year with the prophets. The church has risen up against the prophets. Big name evangelists and pastors and, and even charismatic people have risen up against the prophets. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't cross a prophet. And let me tell you, Noah never asked the council and said, Hey, count prophets, council, prophetic council, God told me to build an ark. Do you think it's him? And they said, no, it's too judgmental, right? And he said, sorry, God. He goes to God. He's like, sorry, God, I can't build an ark because the prophets, you know, the Christians won't let me do it. You know, the spiritual people won't let me do it. And I don't see anywhere, you know, in the Bible where prophets had to go ask for permission to prophesy. That's right. Because they hear from God and they speak it to the king. God says, go do this. They go do it. And so, um, so anyway, there's, there's a move against the prophetic voice. Um, the next slide says, it is a poor sermon. This is George Whitfield. It is a poor sermon that gives no offense, that neither makes the hearer displeased with himself nor with the preacher. And I just say, I, I feel this week a, a bit of a humble tigger, and I think it's important for preachers not to intentionally try to hurt people, right? Yeah. Because if you're trying to say, you know what your problem is? It's not going to convict, right? right? And so... I hope today that any conviction that falls upon you is by the Holy Spirit and not by me. <laughs> so, if you're still on the fence, if I was on the fence, what would I do? I would get off the fence. Because the word of the Lord is God is getting ready to knock the fence down. And you're going to fall on the side that you don't want to be on to. Okay, let's talk a little bit review last week. Cultural drift. You guys remember I talked about cultural drift, and I started making this diagram. Go to the next diagram, the first picture. And if you would picture the truth, which is Jesus is the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. The Bible is the truth. That is our standard. That's right. And the reality is that the culture is, is running away from the truth. And, of course, it happens to be to the left. Okay? The culture is running to the left of the Word of God. And God's word is the standard for morality, family, education, business, economics, government, arts and entertainment, science. God's word is the standard for life. And so it was amazing. When I started writing, when I started drawing this, it kind of shocked me. Do you notice where the church is politically? I think this should scare us. The church is, so if the, the Republicans, of course, are the don or the, 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 the elephant, the Democrats are the donkeys, um, but the church is, is actually in the middle, yeah. like as a whole, like, and you could say Catholic church, Protestant church, whatever, um, and they're in the middle on like abortion, and they talk about, you know, they're pro-abortion, no politics, seeker-friendly, virtue signaling, vo wokeism is just invasive in the church today. And of course, um, the Democrats are racing towards communism now. Yeah. BLM, CRT, LGBTQ+, socialism, Marxism, communism. They're running to that. Moral relativism is what it is. And so uh, there's been a prophetic call, though. And the prophets are saying, stop. Yeah. Yeah. Stop the ship. Yeah. we got to turn around. Yes. Because there's a cliff that you guys are going off of. That's right. and, and there's a prophetic call to stop. And, and notice where the prophets are too, you guys. 
I think we're trying to reclaim the, the I mean, the fire and the, the righteousness and holiness yes. of the early church. Yes. You know, what does it say about Lot in Sodom? His, his, his soul was vexed. Yes. Yes. You guys, our souls are vexed. Yes. If God were to show up, and I'm going to talk about some of that, the presence of God showing up, the idols fall. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? I, I, I've exper- I think I've <laughs> started to experience this in my own life, maybe about three years ago. If you ask for an encounter with God, and he touches you. You know, the angel that wrestled with Jacob, he limped for the rest of his life. Yes. Yes. And I believe firmly, if you really have an encounter with the living God, you're going to limp the rest of your life somehow. Yes. So when the presence of God shows up, he shakes the idols. Yes. And, you know, w- there's a prophetic word that we received that, that there's a shaking coming. Yes. There's a shaking coming. And I, I believe, you guys, the shaking began in 2020. The shake, the real shaking began. And God is, she's shaking the nations, but now he's going to start shaking the church. And another scary prophecy was about the Gideon's army. God, he first said, there's too many of you guys. Was it 20,000? 30, a bunch of them, right? And then he said that too many. And then he cut them down. And so there's another prophetic word that God is getting ready to cut the church down again. And that a great deception is coming. So watch out. So what I'm saying is there's a prophetic call. And I think the church and even the prophets, like, we're still saying, wait, we need to go back to the truth. Yes. We're broken. We're sinful. We need to go back to the truth. Yes. We need to get our courage again to tell people what we think, to tell people what truth is. Yes. Pastors are so afraid of, of offending you because you're going to leave the church. Jesus. Of offending you so they can, you know, lose, you can pay for this building. And I think, you guys, one of the things, and we're not to judge another man's servant, right? Amen. We're not to judge another man's servant. So when somebody rags on a mega preacher, don't let them rag on them in your presence. Right? Right? But my question is if your platform holds you hostage to telling people the truth, that's not good. I think some churches, if the pastor stood up and preached what I'm saying today, they couldn't pay for the building. They couldn't heat the building. They couldn't cool the building because they get up and they preach the truth and half the congregation or more would leave. And so we need to preach the meat of the Word of God. Lord, bless them. So let's go to the next slide. Bless them, Lord. So I realize that these people, they're not running just, they're not just running away from the Word of God. They're actually running to something. They're running to men's, the system of men, which is the Tower, which is the tower of Babel which is a historical event, it happened. Um, And basically the Tower of Babel is not just a figurative idea, it represents, but it does represent today, moral relativism, idolatry, rebellion, everything that men's opinions have come up with this idea. We're gonna figure out how to ascend to heaven on our own strength. It represents even works. You guys, we're to walk in grace, not works. You can't qualify. You can't qualify. You can't qualify. So, so they're racing to the Tower of Babel. They're racing to this. And so we need to stop the ship and move onward. Okay, so next question is, what is idolatry? What is idolatry? Are you guys ready to be shaken? <laughs> you know, we're singing that song, set a fire in my soul. I'm not sure I want that fire. <laughs> You know, think about it, because fire hurts, fire burns, fire is painful. And you guys were asking for compassion of God. And I'm just like, uh, it, I want to go with the presence of God. I want to go with the fire of God. But I think, you know, those scriptures says our God is a consuming fire. He's a consuming fire and he's going to burn. He's going to burn and there's going to be pain. <laughs> There's going to be sacrifice. You still want to follow Jesus? (laughs) Amen. Amen. I still want to follow Jesus. Who else can we go to? Romans 1.25 says, this is what I think a really great definition of idolatry. It's Romans 1.25. Who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator? Who who is blessed forever. Amen. So whenever you start to worship 
something that is created. Yeah. And the, everything is created unless it's God. Yeah. That's right. So everything could be an idol. And I love what Christina prayed earlier. A desire could be, could be idol, an idol. Yeah. Anything. It doesn't have to be a Buddha statue, which, by the way, if you have a Buddha in your house, get rid of it. Because yeah. that's the obvious ones. Yeah. Get rid of the statue. Start there, right? <laughs> I, I have to tell you, I, was, I think I shared this story. It, it was amazing. A couple years in a row, on the first of the year, God gave me some evangelistic thing that happened. And one, I was asked to a house blessing in the area, in like a Nepali house, a bunch of Nepalis. And we we're down having Nepali church in their basement. It was like, I felt like I was in Nepal. And, we're, and I noticed there was a Buddha in there, like upstairs, in their like uh, karyo cabinet kind of thing. And, and I, the Lord just spoke to me about, was it Rachel and the idols? Yeah. She stole the idols wow. from the father's house. Yes. Yes. And they're leaving and, and, Jacob, and they come to Jacob and say, hey, I, I'm giving you my, my daughters. You're taking all my sheep because God has blessed you. You could at least left me some idols to worship. And he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And then Rachel's like, I don't know what you're talking about either. And she stole them. Yeah. And so the Lord showed me that. And I, I, had, I couldn't, I couldn't not tell them. I was like, hey, I can't bless your house unless you get rid of this Buddha. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so when I went upstairs, it was gone. So praise the Lord. I don't know what happened to it, but they, they honored the word of the Lord. <laughs> so when the word of the Lord comes, yeah. let's be quick to obey. I, we need to throw things away, burn things. Yeah. You know, um, if, you, if, if you throw it in the lake, whatever it is, <laughs> you know, don't pollute. Don't but don't pollute. I've heard of people throwing away like rings that, that are like um, that connect you to the occult, like in a lake, you know, or something. Get rid of it. If you don't know how to destroy something, we need to get rid of it. So Exodus 20, 3 through 4. So people are saying today, Christians are saying, oh, pastor, it's just an idea. Why can't I kneel? Why can't I kneel? It's a problem for sports people, right? It's a big problem. You know, national anthem comes up. Hey, I want to support. I want to support people of, of color, black people, because I, you know what? That's a good thing. Equality, great. So what do they do? They kneel. But the Bible says, Exodus 23 through 4, it says, You shall have no other gods before me. Yes. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of, wow. can you say it with me? Anything. Anything that is heaven or above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down to them nor serve them. Yes. That includes ideas and ideologies and yes. movements. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. Yes. So that is one of the deceptions that I have confronted with Christians saying, what is wrong with bowing to the BLM, for instance? Whatever. The Bible says you shall not bow to anything. Because when you bow, it's a form of worship and fealty. Yes. This is just truth, okay? Yes. Anything else is you, you just don't understand. Next slide. Our nation is full of idols. Mm -hmm. And I think so many people don't see this today. Paul's spirit was grieved yeah. as he walked through the streets of Athens because it was given to idolatry. You guys, if you walk around downtown today, you're going to see yes. idols yes. Yes. that are offensive offensive and I won't go into details Isaiah 6 5 says woe is me for I am undone because I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the King the Lord of hosts you guys when you see God you're gonna realize wow, what a horrible sinner you are <laughs> you're gonna realize I am in my I have unclean lips you guys, think, I want you to meditate on what unclean means. That's right. What does unclean mean? Our entertainment is unclean. Our, our, our words are unclean. Our thoughts are unclean. Yes. And Jesus always cast out unclean spirits. He never cast out clean spirits. Yeah. <laughs> right? They're always unclean. Mm -hmm. So, dirtiness, foul stuff, all that goes with unclean spirits. So, next slide. Jeremiah 7, 9 through 11 says, Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and walk after other gods whom you do not know, and then come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations. 
Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of thieves in your eyes? Behold, I, even I, have seen it, says the Lord. So what we have today in America and in our lives is we, during the week, we worship other gods, and then we come and we worship the living God. And that should not be so. And I don't want anybody, including myself, not, don't point fingers at others, point them at yourself. So search yourself. God, what, is, what idol is in my heart? Somebody said yesterday, I was asking me, like, well, Matthew, when did you get saved or whatever? And I was like, or I forget what the question was. I was like, I, I feel still, I'm still trying to, he said, when did you give your life to the Lord? I was like, I still feel like I'm trying to give my life to the Lord. And it's like the angel that's wrestling with me, right? Yes. And so, like, there is a point of surrender that I, I believe we can come to and get to. But it starts with taking a step and saying, Lord Jesus, here I am. All right, so syncretism, I want to talk about syncretism. I'm going to get some more water here. I want to talk about, do you guys know what syncretism is? And syncretism, and there's, you know, I kind of defined it here because it was a little bit, um, it was really the attempt to combine religions. That's really what syncretism is. Where somebody says, oh, you, Jesus is a good guy. I like him. I go to church sometimes. But, you know, I'm really into Buddhism. That's syncretism. Sure. And, and, uh, and really, too, you know, works is syncretism, too. He's like, you know what? I believe in Jesus, but I really feel like I have to work my way to heaven, right? I've got to be a good person. Yeah. That's not Jesus. That's not the Bible. So, so see how we can easily get snared by syncretism yeah. in any area, whether it's an actual idol or whether it's an idea of how we should be Christians, right? And so Exodus, 20, Exodus 23, 31 says, For I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you shall drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. So God knows best. Well, wasn't there a TV show or something back in the 50s called Father's no, Father Knows Best? Yes. God knows best, you guys. He, he created you. He's the one who has the owner's manual to your engine. He knows, he knows how, to, how you work best. God designed us to, to be married spiritually to one God. Yes. Right? That's how he designed us. And when we, when we have a divided loyalty, our heart is divided. And I really, you guys... And this is the wrestle that I just mentioned, is wrestling to give God your whole heart. Yes. And I think the devil cannot risk a person who's wholehearted. Yeah. I, I want to I preach and write maybe a book even on wholeheartedness because people don't talk about wholeheartedness. If you knew your potential, wow. yeah. if you knew your potential, your wholehearted potential, you would be unstoppable. Every yeah. single human being... You have so much power in you. It's like, you know, a car or a chainsaw, like the example, is if you churn the heart on 100%, mm -hmm. yes. there's so much power. You know, most of us, and I hope you don't use all the power in your car every time you get in it. Because yeah. it'd be, and, and that's why we need self-control too, <laughs> right? But that's why we need to put our wholehearted devotion to Jesus, yes. right? Okay, so Exodus. 20 verses 3 says, You shall have no other gods before me. This is a pretty uncompromising stand that God has. You shall have no other gods before me. Okay, so now I want to um, go to the, the account of the Ark of the Covenant and the Philistine god Dagon. And I don't know if you've heard this before. So if you go to... 1 Samuel chapter 5. And guys, we're going to start seeing this happen. Amen. Yeah. So I want to just say, don't be so worried about the idols that you see mm -hmm. in other people's life and in this city. It should grieve our hearts to pray and seek the presence of God because when God's presence shows up, He will judge the gods. Yeah. And I, I really truly believe the, the prophetic word that we heard at the return, Pastor Christmas, He said, God said, and I don't know if you've ever seen a prophet like him speak like that. But when he stood up and spoke, it was as if God was speaking himself. Right. It was like, that is what a prophet is, is a voice, a mouthpiece. 
And he, he said, God is, he, he said, God, God is coming to judge the gods of America. Yes. He said, I'm coming to judge the gods of America. So you wonder why all the evil is getting exposed, the, the social media and the, the NFL now, <laughs> the sports. You know, there's not a lot of glory. I mean, you, could, you could ask sports people. There's not a lot of glory when there's no fans in the stands. I, I, watched, I was watching, was it Stanley Cup last year? And they're like, we won, we won. It's like the music is going and there's just no fans. There's no glory. No fans, no glory. <laughs> So God is judging the gods. So, 1 Samuel 5. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod when the Philistines took the ark of God. So they captured it. And when the people, uh, they, let's see here. They brought it into the house of Dagon. So apparently Dagon was a, a merman. That was the idol. It was half fish, half man. And I'm just thinking, man, there's certain like corporations. <laughs> that have certain symbols that happen to be in the Bible. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> uh, Dad and I were at this certain corporation yesterday, and they, having a nice cup of uh, certain substance, like <laughs> enjoyable caffeinated beverage, and uh, they are beating your eyes with the rainbow movement. That's their whole thing. And my question, guys, and I even asked Dad, is at what point does something become sacrificed to idols? Food. Yes. And that's ch challenging because our nation is full of idols. And at what point, I'm not telling you, I'm not making a, I'm not taking a doctrinal stand, but we have to ask ourselves, at what point can I not eat something because it is being sacrificed to an idol? And so, anyway, so my point here, so I'll continue. And when the people of Ashdod arose early in the morning, there was Dagon fallen on his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set it up in its place again, right? These Philistines didn't ever get a clue, by the way. <laughs> they didn't. And when they arose early the next morning, there was Dagon fallen on its face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. The head of Dagon and both the palms of its hands were broken off on the threshold. Only Dagon's torso was left on it. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor any who come, come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod to this day. But the hand of the Lord was heavy on the people of Ashdod. You guys, the hand of the Lord is heavy upon the nations of the earth. You guys, we should be aware prophetically what's happening. There are flash floods happening all over the world right now. China, Turkey, Germany. In Germany, 150 people died in a flash flood. And then we have yesterday, we had all these flash flood watches here. You guys, we should say, hey, and, and you know, I, pro I preached about, you know, the, the, the God of science. What is the God of science? You guys know. Who is the goddess of science? You know, Mother Earth. The goddess of science is Mother Earth. It's not science. Here's the thing. Two things. They don't believe God created heavens and the earth. They're wrong to start with. Their premise is wrong. Secondly, they don't believe that life begins at conception. That's the second offbeat. Why should you listen to everything else they have to say? That's right. That's right. So they're... So they're <laughs> I was going to mention who the high priest of science is in the nation. And you know his name too, by the way. It starts with an F. The high priest of science, name starts with an F and ends with an E. Okay? I, yeah. So, where was I? But the hand of the Lord was heavy on the people of Ashdod, and he ravaged them and struck them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. And when the men of Ashdod saw how it was, they said, The ark of the, the God of Israel must now remain with us, for his hand is harsh toward us, and Dagon our God. So when God's presence shows up, his hand turns harsh towards the gods and towards the people. So you guys, that's why we need to be in the presence of God. We need to be in prayer. We need to be in the word. We need to be in fellowship. If you sin, you need to get in fellowship because the blood of Jesus cleanses of you all sin. Because there is a moment coming of judgment and we need to be found in Goshen. Right? In Egypt, the Israelites... Right? God, the judgment came upon Egypt strong, but the Lord guarded his people. Yes. So we need to too be that way. So therefore they sent and gathered themselves all the lords of the Philistines and said, What shall we do with the ark of God of Israel? And they answered, Let the ark of God, the God of Israel, be carried away to Gath. So um, I'll finish it. So they carried the ark of God, 
of Israel away. So it was after they had carried it away that the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he struck the men of the city, both small and great, and tumors broke out on them. Therefore, they sent the ark of God to Akron. Ekron. So it was as the ark of God came to Ekron, the Ekronites cried out and say, they have brought the ark of God to Israel to kill us, to us to kill us and our people. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it go back to its own place so that it does not kill us and our people. For there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of God is very heavy there. And the men who did not die were stricken with tumors and the cry of the city went up to heaven. You, perhaps you've noticed that we have a Jesus is Lord banner on the, this house and an appeal to heaven. And that's because we don't want to be judged with the wicked. Right. When judgment comes, I say, Lord, don't forget that this city has righteous with the wicked. Yes. Yes. Amen. You guys in agreement with me here? Yes. That's what the blood of Jesus. Lord, don't judge us with the wicked. When the judgment comes, when the, when the idols fall, don't forget this house. Yes. We ask for your mercy. You guys, the judgment of God is very real. And you know, when we go through life, we don't immediately see consequences sometimes to our sins or whatever. And, and let's not be like the people who mock and say, well, when is the coming of the Lord? Look at the fossil record. God has already judged the earth and he will judge it again. And so let's, let's be wise. <laughs> okay, so, so God is coming to judge the idols. And the amazing thing is the Philistines, they never, they never said, oh, hey, maybe we should be, serve this God. Mm -hmm. They never said that. Jesus. They said, let's just get it out of here. Yeah. So they saw the living God do things and they didn't, they, they didn't get a clue. Their eyes were still blind. Yeah. And so you guys, we have to come to a place in our lives. And this is like part three sermon here. Because yeah. <laughs> I still want to talk about Meshach, uh, what? Meshach. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and them. I want to talk about these guys. I want to talk about, let's go to the next slide real quick. I got to wrap it up though. I got to talk about, you know, is it okay for a Christian to bow? No, no, no. Thank you, Jesus. That's good. I want to, okay, I'll show you one drill thing that will quick it up. A couple slides down. It says, is it okay for a Christian to bow to an idol? Answer? No. No, no, no. Next, next one. I wonder, let's ask Chinese Bishop James Su Shimin. Chinese bishop, imprisoned for 40 years, may be dead. Congress, Congress warns. It says, refusing to bow to the Chinese government. Wow. Wow. Dad already got into this. You guys, don't be fooled. Communism is a government cult. Next slide. Yes. Yes. And I, wa I wanted to show you this last week. Mm -hmm. This was part of their 100th anniversary celebration. There's a flag, and what are they doing? It's an artistic thing, but they're all worshiping this flag. So I want you to know that there are idols in the land, and, um, and the music is playing. The music is playing. Will you bow? Will you bow? Go to the next slide real quick. The music is playing. The music is playing. And I don't, I don't have time today. I wish I did to go through all why... You know, all those things on the surface are good, okay? If, if you don't believe Black Lives Matter, you're a horrible person, <laughs> right? But what is under it yes. is not. That's right. It's not. Yeah. So, so um, I'll wrap it up real quick. Show those men, please, that did not bow. This man didn't bow. He's a Christian. They said, why didn't you bow? He said, I'm a Christian. Next, this man didn't bow. And they said, why? He said, what did you say? He said, so I just believe that I can't kneel before anything besides God. And let me conclude with a, a quote from Jeeves. He says, it is as well to know exactly what tunes the devil is playing, sir. We need to know what the music is. What is the music? There's a, there, it's called, and it, if I have more time, it says in symphony, it's all working together. All this music has been coordinated and planned in symphony and harmony. And when it starts, are you going to bow? And I'm not going to say it's going to be easy because it's not going to be easy to not bow. All right, praise the Lord. Well, let's pray and conclude. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we just humble ourselves to you. And Lord, we recognize that there is... 
You are present in this nation. Lord, we thank you that you are doing something. And Lord, we look at the bigger picture and that encourages us in our own personal lives, Lord. And Lord, we thank you. We humble ourselves right now as the shaking hits the church. Lord, we pray that we would pass the test. Lord, that our churches, our families, Lord, would, 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 would pass the test, Lord, of the shaking. And Lord, that you would shake these things out of our hearts and lives, Lord. And Holy Spirit, we just ask that you would begin to finger these idols. And Lord, help us humble ourselves and, uh, and, clean, and get rid of these idols in our lives. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. We'll take a deep breath. That was just really good. Thank you, Matthew. Yes. Sounds like we'll be seeing uh, probably on the 15th or something like that. We may be talking about part three. Yes. Praise the Lord. It's really been eye-opening for me. How about for you? Yes. Um, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.